Hello, good morning. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, this uh, mostly rainy day, although the sun's coming out a little bit in uh, much of the state. So we're so happy to see you here today. Um, I want to first take a, just a quick minute to thank our sponsor. Uh, Ingram is sponsoring our day today and we greatly appreciate them. Uh, this is our first full day of virtual programming. And we couldn't be more excited to kick it off with our friend, author, and activist, Kate Schatz. And I'm gonna to get to Kate in a minute. Hi, Kate. Um, and also Kate is joined by a Kaliba board member and legend in her own time, Melanie Knight. <laughs> Hi, Mel. Good to see you. Um, anyway, Mel is with Books Inc., as you probably know, and we are so happy to have them here together today. Uh, before I turn it over to Melanie for her discussion with Kate, I wanted to play just a very special message from a friend of ours and an indie bookstore fan. Hi, California Independent Booksellers Alliance. It's W. Kamal Bell. I'm sorry I can't be there with you. I wish I could be there with you. I'm not even in California. I'm in Boston. Can you tell? Does this look like Boston? That's where I'm in Boston. But uh, yeah, have a good time. Talk with my friend, my co-author, and most importantly, my co-conspirator, Kate Schatz, about our new book, Do the Work. Yay, that bus, that's a Boston bus. It just went that way. I can prove I'm in Boston. Oh, you missed it. Anyway, have a good time. Oh, it's great. He's the best. That's the perfect way to segue right to Mel. Oh my gosh, yes, that was so cute. And um, I'm still not sure if I believe he's in Boston. You know, we missed the bus. We didn't see it. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with Kate Schatz. Um, I'm sure as most of you know, she is a New York Times bestselling author of Rad American Women A to Z, Rad Women Worldwide, Rad Girls Can, and Rad American History A to Z. So just about anything rad. Um, she's also a public speaker and an educator, which I'm sure will definitely come up when we're talking about do the work. And as you may have guessed also from this, she is very much an activist. Hi, Kate. How are you doing this morning? I am great, Melanie. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so excited to be here. Um, we're here to talk about your book or more like an activity workbook. Um, called Do the Work. Uh, for anyone who hasn't heard about it yet, it's a hands-on workbook for anyone overwhelmed by a racial injustice, who feels shocked by all the American histories they never learned, and who keeps asking the questions, what can I do? The answer is do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, so your book's not out quite yet. It comes out June 21st of next year. Um, so I was able to see a little bit um, some of the prints from the book and let me tell you I was all ready ready to get like a pen and paper and start doing the work myself it Wait. is fantastic I Thank cannot you. say that enough I was talking about it so much with my husband as I was going through it um I guess one of the first things I'd really like to ask you about is how, how did this book even come about like I can take a guess but I would like to hear it <laughs> absolutely well thank you so much Melanie and thank you Everybody watching, um, thank you all for selling books independently. You guys are my favorite. Um, and thank you for having me and Kamau uh, virtually. I do believe he is actually in Boston. Um, he actually <laughs> travels. He travels so much, I'm always losing track, um, but I'm pretty sure that's the truth. Um, and I do have a, well, I have my very, this is one of my, uh, <laughs> This is how I edit. This is actually really sloppy, but um, I can give people some little sneak peeks of some stuff today. Um, but awesome. this book came about, well, as, as you may know, Melanie, uh, in 2020, people started talking a lot about racism and white supremacy. And uh, some of those people talking about it, uh, it seemed a little bit new to them. Um, yeah. And a lot of other people were like, mm, been talking about this for a long time. And Kamau and I, um, uh the, the kind of short short long story short um is that in the wake of the murder of george floyd at the hands of derek chauvin and other minneapolis police officers kamau as a as a comedian who also talks a lot about race and social justice and politics um as a black 
comedian, he found himself in the position of suddenly getting hit up by everybody who wanted to hear his perspective. Um, and that included a lot of uh, the late night talk show people. So Jimmy Fallon wanted him on, all these people, and he'll, he'll say, all these people who never booked him before suddenly really wanted him on the show. And they wanted him like, like not like next week, they wanted him like now. Um, Kamal and I have been friends for a long time. We've done a lot of events together and we're real just like mutual fans of each other's work. Um, he um, has my books, my rad books. He's really um, enjoyed those for his young daughters. Um, I've just been a huge fan of his, who is not a huge fan of his. Uh, so one day he texted me and said, I'm getting all these white people asking, what can I do? Uh, and I don't know what to tell them. So do you have any advice? And I said, yes, like, absolutely. Let's talk about it. You know, send me your white people. <laughs> then I get another text from him. Uh, and I was literally driving my car. I was in Oakland on the freeway with my uh, then six-year-old or seven-year-old son. And I get a text from him and he says, I'm going on Conan O'Brien in 10 minutes. Can you talk? <laughs> and I was like, um, okay. So I pulled over and my son is like super hungry and crabby in the back seat. We get on the phone and we talk. He's like, look, I've got this chance to have a platform with this guy. I feel like he's like, I feel like I've said everything I want to say. Like, what else do I tell this white man in a position of power with a huge audience? And so we kind of brainstormed. He went on and in his joking come out way, he told Conan that I was, he said, I've got a white person to be in charge of your, of your whiteness, Conan. My friend Kate Schatz is going to tell you what to do. And uh, that led to um, me going on Conan and, and a whole bunch of social media stuff. But what it also led to is Kamau saying, you know, hey, what if we do a book? And I was like, okay, let, let's do it. This is during the pandemic, of course. Um, we were both looking for new projects. And um, I have always felt as an activist and as someone who's cared deeply about um, social justice and racial justice for a very long time. Um, my activism takes a lot of forms, you know, it's organizing, sometimes it's being out in the streets, but I see my writing and my books as that's my, my, my preferred outlet for, for getting the message out. And, you know, again, he suggested, let's do a book. What's interesting is that we didn't say anything else. We said, okay, cool, let's Zoom, talk about our ideas. We didn't compare notes. And when we got there on the Zoom, we had the exact same idea, which was, wow. yeah, for real. And we were like, what about, and I thought I was being ridiculous. I was like, this might sound crazy, but what about like an activity book? Like, does that sound ridiculous? And he was like, um, I'm actually thinking the exact same thing. And then we both referenced the same thing, which was the Brain Quest activity books um, that our kids who were home because of the pandemic that we were trying to force on our kids <laughs> to, yeah. to learn. And we both had those. And we said, what if it was something like this, but for adults who we just need to try some different uh, tactic to, to get people engaged. Um, and that's, that's uh, how it started. I love it. I love it. That was going to be my other question. How, what made you think of a, a workbook? But I, I feel like you've answered that. And looking at the workbook, let me tell you, it, <laughs> I just, I think it's amazing. And, um, it, it's it's definitely yeah brain quest but for adults about anti-racism yeah, it's um, a little bit highlights for children a little bit brain quest and then a conversation between us and one of the things I say too is that um you know I have a I have a history as an educator I taught high school mm -hmm. for a long time um again Kamal and I are both parents of young children um and he's a stand-up comic so I think being a comic being an uh, educator and being a parent what you have in common is that you're really used to trying to get people to pay attention to you. <laughs> uh, you're used to tough crowds, basically. Yeah. And you've got to find ways to engage your audience and in, in kind of unexpected ways. So we felt like this format of using these activities um, and these games could maybe, maybe pull people in um, and get them to engage in some content that otherwise maybe they'd be intimidated by or turned off by or less likely to really kind of grapple with. Yes, and I definitely picked that up all throughout there. Um, it, it not only is it you have some activities that you're still learning. It's not like you're just playing a game. You're still learning with the activities. And then on top of it, there's, a, there's still a lot of humor throughout it. Um, uh, I just, it, it, I can't talk about it enough. It's, it's great. Um, I had another question for you. And then, of course, as you were talking, it left my mind. 
So let me look at my notes real quick. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I was gonna, um, I'm gonna take all my sticky notes off this cover so I could actually show. I don't think I'm supposed to do that. Like, I think there's supposed to be some kind of big cover reveal, but. Uh, well, here it is. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't really, whatever, it's fine. Let's see, I'm gonna slowly reveal. Do to do, taking all my post-its off. Uh, anyway, this is what the cover looks like. Oh my gosh, I love it. Again, I'm totally not supposed to be, this is like the shabbiest, like this is nowhere near the final, but look, you guys get to see it. We're little cartoons. Yes. And one of the things that I love about working on this book, there's so many people involved in it. Um, and we have a lot of different illustrators um, all throughout. Um, they're all illustrators and artists of color. That was one of our big Great. things we specified. Um, so these little, here's a little Kamau. Um, and those are done by Marcus Kwame Anderson, who is um, a comic. Um, a comic artist, and he just did the illustrations for the really great um, Black Panther Party graphic novel that Ten Speed Ooh. put out. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I um, as I was looking at the workbook, I found myself turning like the laptop upside upside down so I could see some of the answers. <laughs> I was like, that's the other thing that I wanted to point out is that I would not have passed any of these tests. No. Um, to they you know they give you a little example of what you would have to fill out to be able to vote if you were um, a black male at the time, mm -hmm. and I would not. There's no way <laughs> I would pass those tests. Um, I also love how you say uh, because this is very true for me as well. Is like I would I used to say I, I don't like history. Mm -hmm. um, history is boring. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in it. Um, but it, that's not what it is. It's history class was boring. Yes. History isn't boring. History class can be boring. Maybe not for everyone. Some people just naturally are like into it, but it, it is, um, it was very boring and hard for me to focus just a bunch of dates being thrown at me. Um, and obviously not the history, not the true version of how history actually went down because mm -hmm. in most schools, you're not getting every piece of information that you really should be learning about. Um, so I thought that was very interesting to see that in the workbook. And it, it was definitely a clarifying moment for me. It's like, yeah, I don't, you know what? You're right. I don't hate history because when other people present it to me in this type of way, or I have a really good friend who's also a history major. And I always tell her she should be a teacher as well, because it, it, if you're just told it in a different way, sometimes it just makes more sense. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like the workbook is one of those things where I think it will really resonate with people who who like to learn, but also want some fun and then a little bit of hand holding. I, I mean, treat me like I am a child. Some of this stuff is hard. I need you to break it down. <laughs> so thank you for putting that out because um, I, for folks who know my other books, you know I am a I love history. I'm a I'm a history. I, I love obscure histories, radical histories, marginalized histories, the ones that we don't get taught. That's really been the impetus behind the Rad Women books, um, and that's a big part of this book too. In fact, our editor, when we turned in our first draft, um, she was she was like, "Whoa, there's a lot more like." learning in here than I expected like it's not just crosswords and word searches there's actually a lot of a lot of history so actually the, the book's divided into five chapters and the third chapter is about history it's about American history um and what we don't learn right so it's kind of about for people who are overwhelmed how did this happen still can't believe all the acts of racial injustice and white supremacy that keep happening um it's a chapter that contextualizes that um but still in relatively playful ways. There's a uh, connect the dots. We use the connect the dots activity to just uh, to explain how gerrymandering works and how districts mm -hmm. get packed and cracked along racial lines. We use a color by numbers to explain redlining um, and systemic disparities in housing um, and city planning. And we also do to address this idea of not not liking history. Um, and I think the line that we use is, you know, when people say I hate history, that's like it's like saying, I hate food when you just actually don't like what's on the menu. <laughs> you don't like the way it's been served. Exactly. Um, yeah. So we really do try to do that again in a, in a playful way. And we do include those, some of these tests, like you said. So we, mm -hmm. um, there's a page that's an excerpt from the 1965 Alabama literacy test. Um, but we don't tell the reader that right away. We just say, you know, answer these questions, see what you can do. And then when you turn the page, you realize that that's what it was. Yes. Um, we also include a 
one of the intelligence tests that was given to um, people coming um, through Ellis Island in the early 20th century. Um, and we also include some of the questions that someone applying for citizenship would have to answer in 2020 in order to become a US citizen, to give people some context for how much do you actually know about this country compared to what people need to know um, to, to gain citizenship. So- What I learned is I don't know enough. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I want to I want to say that that chapter um, when as we were putting together that history chapter I was very conscious of like uh, I wanted to also include you know how do we say not just the horrific histories right and I think that's often what we get um, in terms of learning the history of Black America is it's really focused on trauma um, and which is obviously a huge part of it um, but that can be it for the learning. Um, so we did want to include, um, so I, this is actually, I saw in the chat, someone was asking about some favorite sections and some of my favorite sections are here. I'm going to give you guys another sneak peek. I don't know if you can see, but if you remember from highlights for children, they always have the hidden pictures. Yes. Um, where, you know, so we have a hidden pictures scene and it's actually like a dance party and cookout and everything that's hidden um, are all objects that were invented by black inventors during the last two centuries. So you have to find the ice cream scoop and the potato chips and the blimp and the curling iron. Uh, so definitely no tuna casserole there though. <laughs> <laughs> no tuna casserole there. Um, and then my other favorite page, this is, um, we have a lot of coloring pages throughout. Um, you know, we wanna give people a little coloring break. So we had this artist do this beautiful two page spread that is, a jumble of hundred activists and organizations and freedom fighters and incredible people um, that you can kind of color in and learn about and look up on your own. We do a lot of telling people to go do the work. Do the work. You know the book? Yep. Mm -hmm. go, go, you, did you learn something new? Great, go look it up. And you know, you mentioned this idea of handholding. And I think with this book, we're really, we're really walking a lot of fine lines. We're walking the fine line between humor um, about something that's really deadly serious. Mm -hmm. um, and we're walking a fine line between being informative and teaching, but not wanting to be too didactic. Um, and we're also walking the fine line between wanting to welcome people in um, and not have them feel judged or shamed, but not wanting to coddle because white people get coddled all the time, constantly always so um that like hand holding of come on in but not too much yes yeah there. and i appreciated that um especially that you and kamal both give ins instances of where you have messed up before and and just making people feel one of the things that i that i've also been learning in some dai training myself is you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable yeah. And that is is one of the big things when talking about race, especially with white people, is that they tend to get very defensive. They don't nobody wants to be called a racist, but that doesn't mean it's the end all be all. You can you can learn from that. Um, and it's OK to feel uncomfortable in that situation. I mean, as a black person, we are often felt feeling uncomfortable in those situations. So it's your turn and for you to learn how to help yourself in those situations and that like, it's gonna be okay. Everybody's gonna mess up. Even as a, a, a person of color, you mess up. There are other people of color and, and, and other things going on that you're gonna mess up on. But the important part is to take that and uh, learn from it. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that you, you were telling people that in, you know, in the book, like, yeah, you're gonna mess up. It's gonna happen but yeah. you're also going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kamal and I both share stories of times when we messed up and we have a whole section in the book on what, you know, one, what we say is it's when it comes to most things in life, but also about talking about race and racism. Uh, it's not about what do I do if I mess up? Um, and we actually use the F word in the book. Um, but I'm being polite here because it's a Monday morning. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's not what do I do if I mess up, but, but, it's, I will mess up, like guarantee. You will absolutely say the wrong thing. You'll offend someone. You will use a phrase that you think is okay. And it turns out it's not. You'll use the wrong pronouns for someone. This will happen. So it's not what happens if this happens, but rather when it happens, how will I react? Um, and then how will I move forward? Um, you know, like it's, it, we don't, I use the, 
metaphor in the book of uh, this, the white people defensiveness. It's like we turn into like armadillos. We just yes. like do a little ball. <laughs> You know, we don't want to armadillo, right? How can you move through a moment like that with, with grace and humility um, and respect for the person who was who was harmed, right? Um, I think if you've done a DEI training, you've learned a lot about impact and intent. Um, and that stuff is really important, you know? It's, and I, and I think the, one of the reasons Kamal and I both shared stories in here of times when we messed up is because again, as parents, um, we know how important modeling behavior is, right? Like. Our kids learn from watching us. And, and I know that when I'm dealing with my kids, when I share stories with them um, of times when I had a similar experience as a kid, especially my eight-year-old son, who's prone to all kinds of eight-year-old son behaviors, <laughs> when he's having a hard time, when I share something with him and say, hey, you know what? When I was your age, I did something similar and here's what happened to me. It really, really works with him. And I think that that's what we wanted to do with readers is say, look, we're not just telling you this stuff because we're super smart and perfect, but like we're telling you this stuff because we've experienced it and it's happened to us and, you know, and here's how we dealt with it. Yes. I also thought this was great for him because, you know, in 2020, there was all those, here's your anti-racism books that you should read and all of that. And one of the big things that I've, I talked about um, with other black people is like, this is, this is great. Those books are nice and all, but um, one, are you actually going to read them? Mm -hmm. Two, even if you do read them, what do you, what do you do after that? You, oh, so racism is over it. You fixed it. <laughs> it's, it's done. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is the workbook is also a great follow-up to that. So for everyone who sent those, those, you know, those books and those stacks to people, you send this workbook as well. Tell them to do the homework and that you want to see the pages, okay? Because that's what I'm going to do. I'm handing this book out to everyone. <laughs> and that was our, our concept from the beginning. We're like, this isn't like, we're, this is a, this is a companion. Like you are, it's like, I'm imagining you're, you're like, you're woke, like night side table, right? You've got the new Jim Crow, like you're reading all the candy, you've got a wall, um, but then you have this too. And <laughs> like maybe between chapters, you do some stuff in here, um, you know, and, and I think it's true. There is something about those consumptions of those books, which are so important um, and critical, but it's a different kind of learning. And, and we all, you know, we learn differently um, we process information differently, and I want to make sure that we're engaging people on um, on a lot of different levels and in a lot of different modes. Um, and so that's what we try to do here. Yeah, and you bring up a lot of stuff, even intersectionality, um, which I thought was you know interesting because there's a lot of women um, and men who you know say that they're feminist, but take forget that that can look different mm -hmm. for other people um, and their experiences, and and just because. Uh, things are like this for you does not mean that it is like that for, um, you know, a Black person, an Asian person. They, they, they handle the world differently. Um, I also thought it was interesting that, you know, just because I am Black does not mean my experiences cover everyone who is Black. So it's good to talk to multiple people about what's going on in their lives and stuff like that, because my experience doesn't cover the whole Black experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that was also a very good thing um, that you guys brought up in the book. Um, and yeah, and that was important for Kamau and I, that we were really clear on our perspectives and the limitations of our perspectives as, you know, in making this book. I'm very clear. I am a white cisgendered queer woman i am from the bay area i have this i have a particular perspective and set of experiences that have led me here and and it's it's limited and kamau is very clear he's like i am a straight black cisgendered male like this is i have a, i have these experiences um and you know again we're, we're limited so we really relied on and sought out a lot of other folks a lot of thinkers and scholars and activists um, that we know of some that we don't know um, and tried to bring in their voices to the book and I think this is where Kamau has a lot of experience with that with doing his show with United Shades so much of that is about him um, reaching out to and exploring communities that he is not familiar with and he does a, such a good job in the show of trying to find you know he's like I'm not going to speak for for the indigenous experience I'm not just going to do a show about what it's like for indigenous uh, folks, but I'm going to go into those communities. He just was in, I guess before Boston, he was in West Virginia because he just shot a whole episode about um, Black people in Appalachia, Appalachia, uh, you know, and he's like, 
never been there, doesn't know what, what, the commu what these communities are like. And so he goes and he seeks people out. So we did a lot of that in the book, um, sometimes crowdsourcing information, um, consulting with people in different parts, and then sometimes bringing in um, outside people to design um, and create some of the activities. Great. Uh, I can't wait to get a finished copy. <laughs> I really cannot. No. <laughs> um, this is a little side note, but uh, in, in some of the things I saw, there were still some notes in there about what to change. And can I tell you that, wh why, why do we keep using TK for to come? Isn't that what that stands for? Yeah, it is. What? It doesn't what? make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. I, I, I love all those, those little editing quirks that are just still around. Um, yeah. I was like, TK, come, TK, come on. Like we're, we're, this is literally books we're in and we're using TK. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That was just a little thing that I noticed <laughs> that I thought it was really funny. Um, uh, yeah. I also just liked also the messaging of just because you don't know something doesn't mean that you're stupid. Um, yeah. Yeah, like I think that really gets people a lot. They're like, and they don't want to speak up about, oh, wait, I actually don't know what that is because they're afraid that they'll look dumb. But in, in all honesty, most of the people there don't know what is being talked about either. And someone just has to be brave and, and say, I don't know that. And yeah. it's okay. And it's okay to educate yourself on it. I mean, this is one of the, um, I, this is just like a huge thing for me in general. And, and it's hard for me too. I am a, I am a, absolute know-it-all. I am a Virgo know-it-all from the day I was born. <laughs> I've been that way. Uh, and I, but, but like, I, lo I love learning new things and it's, you know, it can be hard when I don't know something, but that to me is incredibly exciting. And so I think it was interesting and, and this book has gone through a lot of drafts and we've had a lot of outside readers. Um, and I, we had a lot of people reading really early drafts and actually a lot of the feedback especially around the history chapter, was early readers feeling really intimidated and feeling kind of uh, like embarrassed and shut down and, you know, sh ashamed that they didn't know this stuff. And so, again, I worked with that fine line of hand-holding and not coddling. And so worked to kind of refine the language around that to really address that, to look, say, look, if you encounter something here that you'd never heard of, like this is not necessarily your fault, right? Like we do this, we live in a country and a system that does not teach us these histories on purpose. <laughs> uh, so your job, if you just encounter something new, that's see that as an opportunity and you can go teach yourself, right? Like you're not a bad person, you're not terrible. Uh, you just didn't know it before. Yes, it's okay to ask questions. Um, I saw in one of the questions here, uh, how did, and we talked about this a little bit before we got on, um, how did pitching go for this book? Um, pitching went, you know, we, we wrote up a, we wrote up a pitch. We wrote up a pretty long, actually, like a very detailed pitch. And we kind of created a lot of early, um, you know, examples of what, what it might look like. And um, it's interesting, a, a lot of those activities did end up finding their way into the book. Um, and the one thing that really got a lot of people's attention in the pitch um, is that um, we mentioned a little bit earlier, Melanie, you mentioned that we have this excerpt from the, um, the literacy test um, in 1965 in Alabama, right? So this is part of the, the literacy test that were given to black potential voters as a way to disenfranchise them and prevent them from voting um, in Jim Crow era um, South. And I actually, we put that at the very beginning of the, of the pitch of the mm -hmm. book proposal. Um, and so that, you know, we basically said, before we tell you anything about this book, please answer these questions. Um, and you know, then when they turned the page, we said, okay, here's what that was, this will be an activity. And I feel like that really got, that really hooked a lot of people. Everybody that we were talking to was like, wow, that really made me pay attention. Um, because it did that, it just what we were thinking or talking about that they didn't know. Yeah. You know. You're pitching to a bunch of editors who are all smarty smart, <laughs> know it all. And all of those people were like, I didn't know that. Oh my God, wow. Um, and that 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 seemed to, to get their attention. So, um, and you know, Mel, and before we got on the Zoom, we were actually chatting. I was telling you the anecdote of the day we pitched this to. We ended up having interest from a lot of publishers um, for the book, and so we had two days of back-to-back all-day Zooms last, and it was exactly a year ago. Um, and it was the day of the huge lightning strikes 
um, here in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. um, and which led to the fires last October or uh, no August, right? It was in August, and I was in Alameda. Kamau was in Oakland. We're on Zoom, and everybody we're talking with is in New York. Um, and in real time, I Kamau and I were both seconds apart, seeing the lightning outside our windows, and we were just like, oh, like. I would do this and then five seconds later, he would be like, oh my God. And everybody in New York's like, are you guys okay? What's going on? <laughs> we were trying to keep it together as like, it just seemed like end times were upon us. Um, and I think that that's like, I think that's kind of baked into the book in a way. I mean, we really, we wrote this during the height of COVID. Um, again, we both have kids who were home from school. Um, our collaborative process, and I think some people maybe asked about that, you know, we worked together, um, but wearing masks for most of the time we were writing this, there were days, oh, yeah. there were days when I would go to his house, um, and we would have to be, we were re- trying to work outside because of COVID, and so we could have our masks off, but then the air quality was so bad during all mm-hmm. the fires last fall, yeah. that then the smoke was too bad, <laughs> so we were like, then we would go separately and work on Google Docs, or we would Zoom, um, you know, and it was, I remember we had a huge deadline on on January 7th that we didn't we didn't make that deadline mm-hmm. because we were so horrified and traumatized from like and it was actually I one of the sections I was writing was about like the history of white supremacy and it was I was supposed to be writing that on January 6th and I emailed our editor and I was like I'm I can't it's just it's just on TV. Yeah. <laughs> History know? is happening right in our eyes. I have you know, yeah. and so that it's like the fact that when we were pitching it was just like right when all that was happening. And then we really um so I think I saw someone else um in the questions asked, you know, what was the hardest part about writing the book? And I think one of the hardest parts was just ever that we were writing about what was happening in real time and mm-hmm. how do we keep this book feel. It's not about being timeless, right? But we didn't, you know, it, we wanted it to feel contemporary, um, but we also didn't want it to be just about the murder of George Floyd. It's not just about the summer of 2020, right? This is about centuries of, of this. This is about the, you know, this is about this this stew that we're all in. Mm-hmm. So how do we keep it topical? Um, you know, but, but again, things were just like, Great news was breaking constantly as we were working on this. So we're like, oh God, now we have to mention this. And like, how are we going to get COVID in? You know, <laughs> um, Kamau was really, um, I'm, I won't say the word addicted, but I just did to Twitter. He's very active on it. He's mm-hmm. very up on the news. It's a big part of his job. And so there were often times when we'd be sitting there writing and he'd just, I'd see him with his phone and I'd just hear him go, oh. and I was just like, okay, all right, what, what happened now? And it was some, some other horrific thing. And then we'd have to figure, okay, are we going to write about that? Yeah. Um, You know, I mean, even some of that we, as you mentioned, we have a section in here about intersectionality and we talk about critical race theory. We talk about Kimberly Crenshaw and we were, we wrote all of that before these, this, all this, the current uproar of all these white people showing up to school boards and getting in fistfights because they think that their kindergartner is learning. Yeah. (laughs) Learning like that a graduate level legal theory in in their kindergarten class so um I'd say that's my long answer of one of the hardest parts was how do we keep it really current without getting bogged down in everything that's happening every day which brings me to another point that um I thought was very interesting um and I don't want to give too much away because well everybody should read this book and like I said pass it out this is your gift okay everyone needs it um, but what was interesting was y- you, uh, you and Kamal give ideas on what you can do to help, you know, be an activist and and change the subject of things. And one of them that I thought was very eye opening was if you're on your PTA uh, mm-hmm. and the things you can do there. Uh, and I just I had never thought about that before um, and how you can really set the tone and try to get discussions happening there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just, I thought that was an excellent idea and there were definitely more excellent suggestions in there. Yeah. And that's in a section. And I think that's kind of a core concept that I wanted, that we wanted to get across in the book, which is that when it comes to doing the work and what do I do, right? So often for people who are not 
don't think of themselves as activists necessarily, don't think of themselves as someone who's involved in that kind of work, um, that when you get upset about an issue that you have this idea that, okay, well, what is it gonna look like? I need to go march, I need to plan a protest, I need to go do a thing. Um, but so often there's so many things that you can be doing in your community, in your home, in your family on a regular basis that isn't about reinventing the wheel or starting a whole new initiative or effort. And so we talk, we have a whole section about staying in your lane and um, that, you know, that's often used as kind of a pejorative, like you need to stay in your lane, but we're like, well, actually your lane's pretty powerful. So what is your lane? You know, like, and, and what, what do you do in that lane? And I do use the example of um, a friend who uh, encouraged another friend of ours to run for PTA president as a form of activism. And we were like, PTA, you know? And yeah. then she was like, no, like this is like, you can have a huge impact in your community, um, you know, in, in these ways that again, it doesn't look like activism, um, but it can be incredibly powerful if you, and, and so we wanted to kind of really point out all the different ways that people can be doing something and doing some work um, in the context of what, what you already do, like in your community, in your church, in your workplace, in your family. Um, that's where the, you know, a lot of the work is. It doesn't always have to be, um, you know, out in the streets. Yes. Um, I also wanted to circle back because it, you were talking about what it was like to work with Kamal. Mm -hmm. And in my head, as I was reading this, I could see you guys talking to each other. And this tells you just how much 2020 and COVID has affected us because I saw it all happening on Zoom. It wasn't, uh -huh. you were never in person in my head. You were all on Zoom just having this conversation back and forth. And um, was it as fun to work with him as it seems like it would be? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. It, it totally is. We have a, we have a great time. Um, you know, and that's, again, it, it, uh, I've been so, I love to collaborate and I have been so lucky with my collaborations. Um, and I, so for those of you who know the Rad Women books, um, I did those with Miriam Klein Stahl, who's the artist who illustrated all of them. And that was a real true collaboration, those books, um, you know, and we didn't, we were very non-traditional with that and that we worked together. We weren't separate, paired by the editor, um, you know, and uh, so I kind of felt like I'll never find another collaborator like Miriam. Like that was like my my one true collaborator. And I love Miriam. We'll do more projects. Um, but it's been wonderful to work with Kamal. Yes, he is just as fun as you would think. And um, yeah, we this book is a conversation. Uh, so often, I think one of the other hardest parts about writing it was that he would be talking, and I'd be like, just, 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 I got. I have to write this down. Like. So a lot, of, a lot of the, a lot of the conversation, and so for for folks listening who haven't seen the book, um, in between all the activities in the book, we is a conversation between Kamal and I as these little cartoon heads, and so we kind of guide you through, and we're talking back and forth, and sometimes being funny, sometimes trying to be funny, um, sometimes being very serious, but it is actually that a lot of that is our real time conversation that we were having. Um, and, and I was literally just like frantically trying to write it down. Um, you know, he, as, especially with his background in comedy, he's just constantly riffing and it's he's like, he's one of those people who's like, he pretty much nails it on the first draft. Um, a lot of the time. So I was just like, ah, say that thing again. He'd be like, I don't know what I just said. I was like, damn it. Damn. That does sound like a lot of fun. Um, and this might be a I don't know, as I was reading through it, I was like, I like that there's swearing. <laughs> there's some swearing. And then this is when I'll tell you all that this is a, this was a two book deal. So we are doing a family friendly kid version um, of this. Um, I am not surprised, something told me, I felt it in my bones. <laughs> and it's fun, a lot of the ideas we had, we would be like, wait, let's do this. And we'd be like, no, let's save that for the kid version. So yeah. we will, there'll be no swears in that one. All right. <laughs> Uh oh, Kristen's here. Does that mean our time is wrapping up? Well, your time is wrapping up, but I wanted to, um, Kate, when is this expected on our, uh, to, to be on the shelves? What well, I think it's June, 2022. It was supposed to be earlier. I don't know. It keeps, it's been shifting. So, um, you know, it was supposed to be now. It was actually initially supposed to be this fall. Um, and I'm so glad that we were able to push it back. I'm really I'm really glad um, because it gave us the time to make it the book that we wanted. Um, I didn't want to, we really didn't want to feel like we had to be rushed to get that race book out. <laughs> um, right. And so we really, so yeah, it looks like, I guess it's June. I don't know. At one point it was April. It's, it keeps changing. So yeah, last when I checked. 
Hopefully they'll have that whole global supply chain thing figured yeah. out. <laughs> when I checked this morning, it said June 21st. Okay. Um, and, you know, also fingers crossed and knocking on my table that that means that we can be really doing some in-person events. Um, oh, that would be great. That would be so great. I'm sure all the stores are going to be lining up to have you guys come and visit because it would be a terrific visit. <laughs> We'd love to see you in real life. <laughs> yeah, I really can't wait to do anything in real life. So. I know, I know, I know. We all feel that way. Well, um, Melanie, as always, you are amazing and we appreciate you so much. And Kate, it was just so great to see you. And we um, we appreciate you joining us. And we're really, um, all of us, very excited for this book. It's important and it's um, it's fun and it's it's going to it's going to just be a, a big hit. I really, really can't wait for it. So um, thank you for being here today. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys uh, have the time to join us at noon today, we have the ever amazing author speed dating mm -hmm. from 12 to 1245. Um, there are going to be, I think, seven or eight amazing authors talking about their new books, and that's going to be really fun. So maybe take a lunch break and join us for that. Uh, you can sign up for uh, everything uh, on our website, KalibaAlliance.org. Uh, if you want to get galleys and take a look at the virtual exhibit hall, that is at uh, Kaliba-Annex. So you can find that um, as well. So um, thank you both so much for spending time with us this morning. We really appreciate it so much. And we hope to see, um, we hope to see many of you at noon.